before you're seated. <laughs> Glory to God, before you're seated, why don't you all turn to the back, just wave at the camera and greet the folks up in Platteville and back home and at home and the Facebook Live and all those folks. We welcome you to church in Jesus' name. So glad that you're with us by the digital technology. When you're available, come on out here or at our campus in Platteville, Wisconsin. Praise the Lord. 11 o'clock, 55 South Court Street in Platteville. And, and by the way, church, if, uh, those of you that are here, if you want to go up and visit that, that's fine. I'm not going to, don't everybody go at one time, though. <laughs> For two reasons. It's good to be with you all here. Besides that, the building can't hold us all. <laughs> so, but it's a great building that the Lord's brought us, and we're so glad that, that he's done that. Well, let's jump into the Word of God this morning, shall we? Amen. What if God wanted a better life for you? And I believe he does. How many of you believe he does? A better life, not just financially, because you can be well off financially, but if you're not healthy, if you don't have friends, if you don't have Jesus in your life, don't have a relationship with your God, you're pretty poor. You know, a better life, whole. Jesus used the word peace in the Old Testament, peace, shalom, wholeness in every way, relationships, physically, peace of mind and, and, and body, all that. That's God's plan for you. What if he wanted a better life for you? Like I say, it, we believe he does. And the 2019 is going to be your best year yet. Well, how would he start that? He'd start that. He'd work in your life. He'd work with his words, with words and with circumstances to bring you to the point of being able to see it. So once you saw it, you could believe it and receive it and enjoy it, walk out in it. Our world, we started along this line not talking last week, and we're going to continue this week and next week. Our world that we live in is not, for each of us, is not the sum total reality around us. Our world, for each of us that we live in, is the, is the world of our own thoughts, our own understanding, our own perspective on things, our own viewpoints of things, how we see the things around us. That's the world in which we live. We see life through a lens of our own making. Every one of us do. Now, I came across a story this week, a really interesting story this week that I want to share with you that really illustrates what I'm talking about right here. I want to talk to you about the island of California. Did you know that for over a hundred years, California was depicted on maps as an island? As an island. In, in, it's, in 1539, a man named Francisco de Uloa. Now, I hope Frank doesn't mind me butchering his name, but that's how we're going to say it this morning. Francisco de Uloa sailed north from Acapulco. Ah. That's, that sounds pretty nice this morning. I mean, can we just adjourn to the ship, right? <laughs> Sailed north from Acapulco, and original maps got it right. Got it right. He, he, he cruised the Bay of California, the Bay of, and, and he depicted in the early maps at the end of the 1500s, showed California, especially Baja California, showed California as the western coast of the continent and Baja California as a peninsula jutting southward, just like it is right now. But in 1602, okay, about, about 60 years later, two guys, Sebastian Vizcano and Father Antonio de la Ascension, they established some things. They sailed up the California coast and returned with a journal. They wrote journals on the way. And Ascension, in his journal, asserted that California was an island and that it was separated by a strait of water from the, con from the mainland all the way from Mexico to the Canadian border. And he turned that body of water the Mediterranean of California. Now, here's the thing, that though the first maps got it right, once that journal came back, map makers began to depict California as an island. Here's an example of the map of California, of the island of California. 
That's how it was depicted. There's that island off the coast with that body of water going up in between. Now, in the late 1600s, now this was 150 years after its discovery, a father Eusebio Kino, a Jesuit missionary, led inland missions to, to Baja, California. He and his group went up and were going up Baja and were establishing missions along the way. Well, they ran into a famine, and so they had to return back to Mexico City. The path that they traced back to Mexico City was the first proof that California was not an island, that it was a part of the mainland. Now, so by the early 1700s, there had been many other journeys, not just the, by, by that priest, but by others all around there, well documenting the fact that California was a part of the mainland and not an island. But here's the amazing part of the story. The map makers decided to keep drawing California as an island anyway. They, they had data to prove that it was not right. They had data to prove that it was not an island, but the idea of, the, of California being an island was so ingrained in people's thinking. The notion that it was not an island was dismissed outright as something that, well, everybody knows that isn't true even though they had the facts to prove that it was true. Now, for the first half of the 18th century, first half of the 1700s, Baja California was intentionally, incorrectly depicted as an island. Just because it was true that anything, just because, here's what people are thinking, it could not be true that anything else was possible. Even though the reality was, it was not an island. People had become so locked in by their lenses that they only saw what they were used to seeing. They only saw what they were used to seeing even though there was a deeper reality, even though that something else was true. And the whole thing was not resolved until the middle of the 1700s. The story finally ended when King Ferdinand VII of Spain issued a royal edict that California was part of the mainland and was the west coast of the continent. Then, then the maps of California as an island began to disappear. Uh, that says something in itself about the fact that they took the word of, the, of a guy? You know, even though they had, but I guess that's another, another thought. Listen, I'm talking to you about the power of our lenses. It seems hardest to see from a new perspective when you've got one that you're used to. I mean, just think about it. You know, I don't know where your TV spot is. I've kind of, we got a new sofa a while back. And I have kind of planted myself on the left end. You know, I don't know how TV looks from the right end or for the, from the chair over there. You're all smiling at me. But how many of you planted yourself in the same chair at church? Time after time after time. You know, we just, we see things from our own perspective. And it's very hard to see things from a different perspective, just humanly speaking. It's very hard to see things from a different perspective when we've got one we're used to seeing in our life. You know, racial things, political things. You know, re rec well, let's go on. See, when we already know what we're looking for, we tend to see what we've already seen. I think we could recognize that. You know, you go to buy a new car. You know, nobody in town has one of these cars. I think I'll get this car. And then you find out everybody else that afternoon had the same idea. And now 500 people in town got the same car. And you see them all over the place. You know, and I, I talk about, you know, we've talked about this, that scientists tell us that we used to, us guys used to be hunters. 
We used to be the providers out there bringing game and putting it home. And now guys can't even find their socks in their drawer. So I tell them this. Well, the problem is you just open the drawer and look at it. What you need to do is stand there and shove it in and out so you can see what's moving. Well, just a joke. But the reality is very hard for us to see something when we've already got an established perspective. Because our minds... Our minds form along the lines that we've established, and we find it hard to see things differently. Uh, I was studying this week about churches, because I lead one, <laughs> and came across something called formative, formative years model, which simply means even as a church, as church people, we tend to, whatever church experience that we've had in our formative years as young people, we tend to default to that and think church is supposed to be like that. But it's kind of, I'll just throw this in. This won't cost you anything. But years ago, 80% of Americans went to church regularly every week. A number of years ago, it was, a study was done, it was down to 40%. Now, now rea- realistically, it's down to 20%. And by the year 2050, it'll be down to 11.8% of people in America go to church regularly once a week. Now, part of that problem is we're still doing church in some ways the same way we've always done it. And part of the strength underlying that habit is the fact that we're looking through our formative years lens. And when we think of church, we think, well, that means doing this. And so we need to be willing to get beyond our lens. Are you with me this morning? See, our perspective becomes synonymous with truth in our minds, even though when reality is something different. Now, Jesus addressed this whole dynamic in his, when he was talking about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Would you go with me over to Luke chapter 16? Jesus was talking to a man about a certain man who was, he was rich. He was clothed with wonderful clothes. And then there was another man who was a beggar, a sick man named Lazarus, who was outside of the gate, and he begged daily right there at the gate and ate uh, the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, and the dogs came and licked his sores, and the beggar died and was carried by the angels, the Bible says, to Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom at this time before Jesus was resurrected, the place where the departed people, when somebody died, they went to a place in the heart of the earth called Abraham's bosom if they were in right standing with God. Abraham is the father of the faithful, and they would go to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and he went to hell, the Bible says. So there's two compartments at that time in the heart of the earth, Abraham's bosom and hell. And there was a great gulf fixed between the two where neither party could pass over. And matter of fact, one man's preached a wonderful message off this, this truth called who's who in hell. There was at least two people there. And the rich man and looked across to where the, the beggar was, Lazarus was, and said to Abraham, he asked Abraham to send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and come cool, cool my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. And there is a hell to miss and a heaven to gain. I'm tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, no, there's this great gulf fixed between the two so that nobody from there can come over here. Nobody from here can come over there. And then the rich man said, well, at least send someone from here above us, someone back to the earth to tell my family so to not to come to this place. And Jesus In verse 20, this is what Jesus said in verse 29. He said, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And the rich man said, no, Father Abraham, if one goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. Jesus said, they have the word of God, they have the law, they have the prophets, they have the scriptures, let them hear them, but they're not hearing them. And he said, no, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they'll hear him. And Jesus makes a very sober statement right here in verse 31. 
that relates back to what we're talking about with our lenses. He says this, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. What's he saying? He's saying if our lens is powerful enough, speaking as human beings, if our lens is powerful enough to stop us from seeing the truth in the scriptures, then it is also powerful enough to stop us from seeing the truth, even if someone rises from the dead to tell us about it. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says that the natural person, the person without Christ in their life, cannot see the things of God. They're foolishness unto them. But thank God it also says in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that you and I as believers, we have received the spirit, not that's of the world, but the spirit that's come from God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. See, without the Holy Spirit in our life, we can't even see the things of God. Our lenses are so powerful that we can't even see the things of God. But thank God for the Holy Spirit. John 16, Jesus said he's come to guide us into all the truth. Without his influence, without his power working in our life, we're lost. Our lenses are so powerful that we walk right in them blindly, not seeing what the Lord has for us. But thank God there is something more powerful than our lenses. The anointed word of God is more powerful than our lenses. They're able to clear our lenses. I, I know I've seen, you know, some of you wear glasses, some of you don't. Now, I know sometimes you walk in and new, go, get new glasses, and the thought will come up, well, you don't have to get new frames. You just get new lenses for your frames. You know, I've seen sunglasses, for instance, or some fashion glasses that you buy them. They have the frame. They have also, you know, several different colored lenses. Anybody seen those like that? You pop those lenses out, pop them back in. Well, thank God the word of God. I'm talking about the power of our lenses and now also about the fact there's something more powerful than our lenses. There's something more powerful than the way we've seen life. And that more powerful thing is the word of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit has the ability to penetrate to change things. I was thinking earlier today about, I've talked with people here in the church that have gone in for eye surgery where they've actually taken off the lens on the front of their eye because they were so occluded by cataracts and things like that. Taken off that lens, put a different lens on. Whoa! <laughs> we can see. Our lenses are so powerful. So powerful. That when, when God wanted to bring Abraham into the blessed life. Let me just stop right there for a minute and say this. When we talk about Abraham, let's realize this. What God, what God did with Abraham affects you and I, every single one of us as believers. Because the promises that God made to Abraham, he made to Abraham and his seed. And Galatians chapter 3 tells us that that seed is Jesus Christ. And all of us that believe on the Lord Jesus... Galatians chapter 3 says, so that they that are of faith in Christ are blessed with believing Abraham. And not only that, we see an example of how God deals with us to bring us into that abundant life, that better life. Let me ask you again, how many believe God's taken you into a better life? Well, how's he going to do it? We see that right here with Abraham in Genesis. God came to Abraham and he began to talk to him. And the first thing he did was get rid of Abraham's doubt and fear. Now, how many times do we see in the Bible that when God shows up, first thing he says is, don't be afraid. We have to realize Abraham was a moon worshiper. Now, how many of you have friends that if God showed up in their living room, they'd be a little bit afraid? They'd be nervous, right? Oh, come on, folks. How many of you, before you accepted Christ, if you'd have got up in the morning and walked in to get your coffee and Jesus would have been sitting at your table, you'd have been a little bit scared. You'd have been, what did I do last night? You know, can he really see my thoughts? You know, well, thank God he loves us. Amen? So he said, don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. I'm your protector. And I am your exceeding great reward. Your reward's going to be very great. And Abram, at that time, 
being the Asiatic people, having children was of, of a special importance back then. Much pressure, so intense that his first response was, what will you give me? If my reward's going to be great. What will you give me seeing I go childless? And this servant in my house, he's going to be my heir. And God said, no, this servant won't be your heir. You're going to have a child and your children, your descendants are going to be as multitude of a multitude like the sand of the sea. And not only that, at that point, God took him outside and changed his lens. In Genesis chapter 15, it says in verse 5, Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. What's he doing? He's taking Abraham outside and doing exactly for Abraham what he wants to do for each of you and what he's doing it for you and in you, working in you, even while you're sitting in here hearing the word under the power of the Holy Spirit. God is working with Abram and he's working with you to change the lenses through which he looked at life. Can you say amen? He said, look up, Abraham. Look up. See the stars? Your descendants are going to be this numerable. Now, how do we walk into what God shows us? We see that right here in verse 6. He says, and he believed, he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. In other words, righteousness is you are what you have to be, what you're supposed to be what you ought to be. You're right in your being. You're right. You're righteous. He believed God. How do we walk into what God wants to take us into? We simply believe God. And we'll talk more another week what it means to believe God because it's not just an intellectual thing. But Abram believed God and it brought him right into the promise. Now listen, our lenses are powerful They're powerful, they operate on an emotional level, but there's something more powerful, and that's the word of God. God, we see it right with Abram, and God's MO was the same with Gideon. Go with me over to Judges chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Judges chapter 6. Now, the Israelites, the people of God, had turned their back on God. And it's important that you understand this, that according to the covenant that they were under right then, they were under the law with blessings and curses based on behavior. They'd walked away with God, so God was duty bound to bring curses upon them. And that's why they were having a hard time. Thank God you and I are not under the law. We're redeemed from the law. We're walking in grace. Can I get an amen from a believer? We're walking in grace. But here's the situation. They were, the Midianites were overrunning the people of Israel, including Gideon. And Gideon, the, 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 the Midianites, their, their armies, their peoples were so vast that the number of camels, when they came in to attack and occupy the land, their number of camels could not even be counted. They rode on camels, in case you were wondering. They, were, they didn't start a zoo. Are you all here this morning? Okay, they, they came in, and they came in, they ate everything, they plundered everything, they left nothing. And so Gideon is grumbling in the wine press. He is in a wine press, threshing the wheat, keeping it safe from the Midianites. And he's complaining. But he's complaining. I don't think he's complaining just because of the circumstances that he's in. I think... He's complaining because deep down on the inside, he recognizes that the the oppression that they're under is not the way it's supposed to be for him. That the way he's being dominated in his life is not what he's made for. That there's there's just something about the circumstances and the attack and, and, and those sorts of things that there's just something about Something about being dominated that warred against the, the, the just knowing on the inside of him that he ought to have dominion in his life. That he ought to be ruling in his life, not being run over by somebody else. At the same time, though that was in him, I don't think he knew that was in him. 
because the angel of the Lord came to him and said to him, and this is Judges chapter 6, verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon was a mighty warrior. God saw that in Gideon, but Gideon did not see that in himself. And so God began to speak to him to get him to see it. God began to change his lenses. We go on and reading verse 13. Gideon said, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, that's his tribe, and I am the least in my father's house. That was his lens. That's how he was seeing himself. But God said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. See, Gideon could not see it, but God saw it, and God helped Gideon to see it. We're going to jump ahead in the story. Gideon gets to the point where he believes God. He puts some tests out. God proves himself faithful. Gideon comes to a point of confidence and begins to rally an army to go out against the Midianites. And he has tens of thousands of soldiers going with him. And God speaks to him and says, you got too many. Sometimes you got to wonder, you know, did he really want to hear that from God? Did he? God, you said go, don't talk to me again until we got the victory. <laughs> no, tens of thousands, God said, you got too many. Send all the fearful home. I don't know how good they'd have been for him in battle anyway. So they sent 22,000 guys out of the 30,000 home. Then God said, you still have too many. Say what? Yeah, you still have too many. He said, take them over and get them all a drink. Have a drink, some water. Those that take them to the brook and those that, those that cup the water up in their hands, and bring it to their mouth. Keep those with you. Those that bow down with their face to the water and lap it like a dog, send those home. So out of 30,000, he ends up at 300. And long story short, they go out and they win a mighty victory. Hallelujah, Jesus. He goes on and says, look at, look at Acts chapter 7, verse 9. Acts chapter, or not Acts, Judges chapter 7, verse 9. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp. See, Gideon, God, here's what I'm talking to you about this morning. I'm talking about the power of our lenses and the power of the word of God to your hearts to override that, to clear up the lenses. Because if you can see something different, you have to see something different. Then you can believe it and receive it. And so God says, he's still working with Gideon. He says, now, if you're afraid to go down, I mean, how many of you think that you might be just a little bit intimidated? I mean, we like to, we like to think about, oh, God spoke to us. God spoke to you, Gideon. Have faith. Yeah, it's real easy for you to sit there on your couch and say, have faith, when you're not the one going out to the battle. When you're not the one going out to try to take on something that the world would say, you're a fool. Anybody with one eye and half sense knows that you can't win, can't do, can't succeed, can't be, can't have, can't make it. And the lens you're looking at says, you're right. But you're just like me. If you're a believer, one day God got through to you. And he put something on the inside of you that's different than that. One of my kids asked me one day, he said, Dad and Mom, he asked, he said, you know, did you, did you see all this? Did you plan? How did you, you know, have all this vision? Did you have all this? You see yourself here from the start? I had to laugh. I said, no, before Jesus came into my life, I was not a man of vision. I was not a person of purpose. I just drifted with every whim and everybody and, and everything. And whoever was popular and was a friend, they had seemed to have some direction in their life. I just go with them. It wasn't until Jesus, I'm telling you folks, every bit of direction and purpose that you see in my life is Christ in me. Amen. He changes our lenses, helps us to see us ourselves and see life differently than we saw it before. 
And so he's still working with Gideon. And he's still working with you and me. And he'll never be done working with us. To help us and to encourage us and to give us confidence in our heart. And so in verse 9, it happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down to the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you, are, if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Purah, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Purah, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and Amalekites, all the people of the east, were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore multitude. And when Gideon had come down, there was a man telling a dream. I think it was a nightmare. Telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. That's quite a loaf of bread. Then his companion answered and said, this is nothing else but the sword of, the, of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered the Midian and the whole camp. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshiped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has... You know, we said, don't we just sound religious? Arise. He probably said, Get up. Get up, for the Lord's delivered us. Get up, because they're meat in our hand. Get up. They're bread for us. We got this. Get up. It's time for us to win this battle. And he took the 300 men and he took torches, gave them a torch, gave them a clay pot over the torch, put a trumpet in their hand, broke them into three groups, put them in places around the camp. He said, watch me and do as I do. And at the right moment, at the word of the Lord, he broke that clay pot, held that torch up high, blew the trumpet, and they all did the same thing. They broke their pots, lifted their lights, blew their trumpets, and started shouting, the sword of the Lord and Gideon, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And all those guys in the camp woke up startled like I used to do. My brother, bless his heart, and I shared a bedroom all the way through school till he graduated and went to college. And the light in our room was a 100-watt bulb with no shade. And he'd get up in the morning while it was still dark in the winter time to go to work. He'd turn that light on and go to work and leave it on. So I know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night, you're half asleep. And, ah! You know, it's like the sword of the Lord and Gideon with torches ablazing. And it went, da, 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 the sword of the Lord. Woo! Hallelujah. They got so scared and so confused that they all killed each other off. And Gideon and his 300 men chased the leaders and ran over and put them under their feet. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm talking to you about the fact that we see life. You've been seeing life through the lens that you've created for yourself. When I was in high school, my guidance counselor, we each had an appointment with a guidance counselor. I went to my guidance counselor, and he said, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? I said, I want to be a lawyer. He said, your family can't afford you to be a lawyer. What else do you want to be? And the light went out, folks. Of course, I didn't end up a lawyer anyway, but I still make a pretty good case. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God had a different plan for my life. I don't hold anything against him. You know, I just tell that story to get your sympathy. Everybody needs an attaboy now and then. <laughs> now I'm telling you about the lenses, talking about our lenses. We see life. So I could have let that dominate my life. Say, oh, Pastor Warren, you could have been a lawyer. Listen, old as I am, there's been plenty of time between then and now. I could have been a lawyer regardless of what my family could afford or couldn't afford. If that would have been God's plan for my life, I'd be a lawyer. But God's got a different plan for my life, and God's got a different plan for your life. He's got a better life plan for you. A better life plan for you. Hallelujah. He, and I, I want you to see that. Gideon could not see the champion that he was. But God could. And God helped Gideon to see it. 
And God's got a good plan for your life as an individual. He's got a great life for your life. Our life together as a church this year, yes, we're going to do awesome things. We started doing wonderful things. We're going to get that campus established. God's made us a hub and spokes. Glory to God. And we're going to be starting other churches. God's got awesome things for us to do together. But listen, God's got awesome things for you in your life. In your life. Sure, what we do as a group, yes. Not taking anything away from that. But also, and even more importantly, in a way for you, is what God does for you in your life. What he's made for you. He's got a better life. Look at Judges chapter 8, verse 28. Just catch one more verse here. And then we'll, we'll close chapter 8, verse 28. It says, Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted their heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Listen, God saw Gideon as a champion. He knew he was a mighty man of valor. He knew it. And I think Gideon, it resonated on the inside of him. Because, yeah, he had some challenges of coming to believe it. He didn't jump on it all right away. He wasn't real eager to jump out of the boat and walk on the water. And yet, when he became convinced, it's because something on the inside of you of him resonated with that. Some said, yeah, this, yeah, yeah. I'm having a hard time seeing it. I'm having a hard time believing it. I don't know if it's really so or not, but, but could it be true? And he found out it was, and he walked out to it, and he walked out into a better life, not just for him, but for his whole nation. Amen. Listen, your life is not all about you. Right. So I want to ask you this morning, how do you see your life and yourself? How do you see you and your life? How do you see you? Are you always going to live in the land of not enough? Or just barely enough? Are you, or are you, are you ever going to make it? Are you ever going to follow God into the land of more than enough? Amen. How do you see you? How do you see your life? Are you, are you discontent with being sick and weak and vulnerable? You know, it's like Jesus asked the man at the pool of Bethesda in John 6 verse 5, will you be made well? How do you see yourself? Will you be well, fit, Strong? You know, how, uh, are you ready to hear a word? Are you willing to hear a word that connects with your more than conqueror spirit and lifts you into an adventure with God? Are you ready to hear that God's made you unique, that God's made you for something great, that God's made you for something larger than yourself. I'm going to close with this. Some of you will be familiar with this one line little poem, uh, and others not. Uh, I guess the Dale Carnegie course, Dale Carnegie uses it. But it really sums up, I think God really can use it to, to speak to our hearts and bring us to the point of, of choice in our life. It simply goes like this. And I'm going to ask the guys to put it up on the screen. Two men looked out from prison bars. One saw the mud. The other saw stars. What are you willing to see? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for your presence in this place. I thank you for your anointing. I thank you for the way it drags down strongholds and it clears off the cataracts off of our eyes and helps us to think, see new and different things. I ask you, Father, to help each of us I ask you to open our eyes to see not all, not all that you have for us, 
but open our eyes to see the next step. The next step that you have for each one of us. I thank you for your anointing in this place and for helping us. We receive this word, Father. Help us to see what you have for us. In Jesus' name, if you agree with me in that prayer, say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Of course, the first next step for anyone who's never done it is to accept Jesus Christ as Lord, to accept what God has said about his son. John 6, 37, John 3, 37, God says, for God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. In another place, the Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That means that you're lifted out of your sins. Not one of us is mistake free. Not one of us has failed to make poor choices. Not one of us has failed to do the wrong thing when we knew what was right. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus took care of that. And all you need to do is believe on him. And he'll lift you out of the consequences and out of that life of darkness. If you would say to me, Pastor Warren, I, I believe what you're saying about Jesus. See, he died for your sins. And three days later, God raised him from the dead so a new life could be made available. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and acknowledge him as Lord, you'll get that new life. See, so if you say, Pastor Warren, I believe that. But I don't know that I have ever at any one point actually done that. That I've ever turned my life over to Jesus and made him Lord. But I'm gonna, I want to do that. I want what you're talking about. Well, you can do that right now. And I'd love the privilege of praying with you. And so all of us are going to pray together. Nobody's going to be asked to come forward or anything like that. You can do business with God right there where you're seated. But I would like to know that I'm praying with you as we all pray together. So if that's you I'm talking to, on the count of three, would you raise your hand to show me that you're praying? Pastor, you're praying with me. One, two, three. Let's say it together, church. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for helping me to see the salvation you as my Savior is the right thing to do. Thank you for making it possible for me to have my lens cleared. And I'm going to walk with you, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord good? Hello and thank you for joining us this week. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, I'd like you to prayerfully consider partnering with us financially so we can get the Word of God to more and more people. We really do pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if you're in this area, next Sunday at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, come on out and join us. If you're not here in the area, then please join us again online next Sunday. Thank you again and God bless you.